the bone. So probably the most obvious function of bone is that it helps to support everything. When we say support, what do we mean? Well, it supports all of your body's soft tissues. So all of your soft tissues are hanging on in or on or within bone. So that's the first important function. Over there and saw that. Support. Support um, all soft tissues. So provides attachment points for stuff to attach on the outside. Attach on the inside, gives us all kinds of support. The second important function is protection. And specifically, bone is really protecting all of our most vital organs, right? Our brain and spinal cord, the most vital organs, are totally encased in bone. And then our heart and lungs, the next most vital organs, are then encased by your thoracic cavity. So protection of our vital organs. I mean, they protect everything, but in particular, vital organs. And you kind of can tell how important an organ is based on how much bone is around it. The other thing that bones function to do is allow for movement or locomotion. And this is going to be something that is assisted by your muscular system or our skeletal muscles. So we'll say that the bones provide the levers for our skeletal muscles to pull on so that we can move. So bones are act as levers for skeletal muscles to pull on. Is that the same as anchorage? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Anchorage? That'd be more like a support thing, probably. Is there more like locomotion? Of an anchorage instead of movement? This came from your book. So I would say anchorage is more like anchoring, so that would probably be more support. Movement is movement, which we can also call locomotion. Okay. The next, this, I mean, whatever words, the movement. No, I'm saying it, yeah. it just totally misses that. This is even from the new edition of the book. I'm redoing all of our lectures, so I don't know why it's missing that, but this is something that you need to know. Another important function is that it stores mineral and growth factors. We're gonna just worry mostly about mineral storage. Uh, mineral storage, this, it stores our calcium and phosphate salts, so. Bones, extracellular matrix, contains a lot of collagen fibers, but it also contains solid ground substance. That solid ground substance becomes solid as we overtake cartilage and calcify it. As we calcify cartilage, it kills off chondrocytes, and then our bone cells can overtake the area and fill up the spaces. So bones are primary storage site for calcium. And this is going to be huge in blood, um, in calcium, blood calcium homeostasis is hugely important in homeostasis, so we're going to talk about that. Another kind of weird thing as a function of bone is that it's actually the site of blood cell formation, or a process that we call hematopoiesis. So all of our blood cells are formed in red bone marrow. We find red bone marrow in spongy bone and then the ends of long bones as adults. So another function is hematopoiesis, which is blood cell formation. And we could say this occurs in spongy bone. more at that. A kind of a weird thing is that we, it's also a site of triglyceride storage, but only in adults and only in this one part called yellow marrow. So for another function we could say triglyceride storage, 
triglycerides are fats. And we could say that this happens in yellow marrow. So fat provides ener like reserve energy or reserve fuel. So if you are in extreme, extreme nutrient deprivation and you've totally burned off your subcutaneous layer, it's possible to burn fat from your bone. And I hadn't really thought about what that would be like because I didn't imagine I'd ever know, any, know of or anything of anybody who was that anorexic. But one of my students once said that she had a friend who was anorexic and her bones hurt all the time. And she said, is that why your bones hurt? And I said, well, probably. <laughs> like, I can't imagine why else. Why else would we store triglycerides there? So you have to be extremely nutrient deprived before you'll access that. But your body has done what it has done, everything that it can to keep you surviving as long as possible. So that's kind of a neat, interesting thing. Uh, and then it also does very, not, this isn't hugely important, but um, it does some hormone production. This stuff called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin is involved in insulin, it helps with insulin regulation and blood glucose regulation. So this is really probably more important in kids who are growing and we need to make sure they've got enough uh, glucose availability to fuel that growth. So, so this isn't something that we'll talk about even when we go into the endocrine system, but just be aware of it. That osteocalcin is produced by bones and it's involved in insulin and blood glucose regulation. And those are our functions of bones. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so we've kind of addressed this before when talking about the different regions of the body and things. So when I asked you on questions like, oh, if a person breaks their femur, they damage what part of their body? A, appendicular, B, femoral, C, distractor answer, and the answer is A and B only. Appendicular, this is that division. So our appendicular and axial skeleton is going to be the first way that we classify our bones. So we have 206 named bones in the human skeleton. That is a lot of bones. You only have to know like 50 some of them. So thank goodness for that. So you may say, oh, it's so many bones. Janessa, ah, it's hard. And I'll say it's not 206. So we divide it first into our axial and then our appendicular skeleton. Our axial skeleton contains the skull and our thoracic cage and our vertebral column. So these are our axial bones. And if we think about functions of the axial bones, they form the long axis of the body. These are the ones that really do our protection of all of our organs. Mm, it's going to be where most of our hematopoiesis occurs as adults. Some of the ends of our long bones have spongy bone. Uh, our appendicular skeleton then is our everything else. So our girdles and our limbs. And our appendicular skeleton is really going to be important for movement. I mean, sure, we can move in our axial skeleton, but a lot more movement happens in my appendicular skeleton. So for my appendicular skeleton, we could think that this is going to be what gives us most of our movement, um, which is also called locomotion. These could also help us if we're thinking they're, they're acting as levers and I need to punch somebody in my face. So that could be a protective function if you want to look at it like that. There's very little uh, hematopoiesis occurs in the ends of some of our long bones as adults. This is where we would have most of our triglyceride storage in those long bones of our limbs. <coughs> all of the rest of them are kind of happening all over the place. Okay, 
So this is showing you our axial bones in red here, or orange, our appendicular bones in tan. So that'll be the first way that we classify our bones. Then we're also going to classify them based on their shape. So according to one of four shapes. And long bones are going to form our, like our general bone idea. When we need to know the anatomy of a bone, it's the long bone we're going to focus on in great detail. All of the rest of them are kind of weird. So long bones are taller than they are wide. So they're taller than wide. And what makes a long bone a long bone is not its overall size. All it is is that it's taller than wide. What does that mean? That means that this distal phalange on my pinky toe is a long bone, even though it's really short. It's, I mean, it's a small bone. It's smaller than these short bones and irregular bones here, but it's still a long bone because relative to itself, it's taller than it is wide. Okay, our short bones are about as wide as they are tall. So about as wide as tall. So a lot of our carpals and tarsals are short bones. Sesamoid bones are a specific type of short bone that are they tend to grow in a ligament. So your patella is a sesamoid bone. Your patella is this bone here in the front your, that, that people think of you know, as your knee. Your knee's a whole joint, but your patella right here is in this quadriceps femoris tendon, and then it kind of merges with this patellar ligament that attaches to the tibial tuberosity. So it's in, that bone is in that dense regular connective tissue. So that's how sesamoid bones tend to be. They're in some kind of tissue, and they vary from individual to individual. So the only one I'm gonna make you worry about is the patella. I'm not gonna make you worry about any other weird sesamoid bones. Flat bones are bones that are, have a flat surface, and they also have a curved surface. So like the bones of our skull, um, so the flat bones have flat and curved surfaces. So like my frontal bone is definitely a flat bone. And if I were to look on the back side of it, I have a nice fossa that can cradle my frontal lobe of my brain. And then irregular bones don't fit well into any other category. They are irregular. So a great example of an irregular bone is a vertebra. So this is showing some examples. Long bones we've met, mm, I think we've met all, yeah, all of our long bones. So longer than they are wide. Uh, flat bone, here's another flat bone that's just showing you your sternum, it's actually curved slightly on the back. Uh, and then short bone, talus, irregular bone, vertebra, 